Hi, I'd like to welcome everybody to our Google Hangout today. Our topic for today is Women's Health and the Affordable Care Act. My name is Yandari Savala. I work for Voto Latino, and I'm happy to be moderating our panel of distinguished guests. Uh, we have um, joining with us, I'll actually have them introduce themselves. So we'll start with, uh, we'll go from left to right on the screen. Um, so Dr. Kuznia, if you'll go ahead and just tell us who you are and a little bit about your background. Okay, I'll I'll enter. I think she's having a little tech difficulty. I'll, let me just tell everybody. This is Dr. Angela Kuznia. She's with Providence Hospital and Georgetown University Hospital. She is a family medicine resident, and she is lending us her expertise today. Hello. Sorry. I think I had my mute on. Oh, not a problem. <laughs> Okay, so we'll move on to Kimberly. Hi, I'm Vanessa. Hi, I'm Vanessa Gonzalez Plumhoff, and I am Director of Latino Engagement and Leadership here at Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Wonderful, thank you. We're going to have one additional panelist joining us in a couple of minutes. Uh, her name is Dr. Diana Ramos, and she'll be joining us. Um, she's the Vice Chair of the Latino Physicians Association of California. She's been practicing as an obstetrician and gynecologist for 20 years, and we'll be excited to have her join us in a couple of minutes. Um, for now, let's just start out with our questions. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who texted and uh, sent questions on social media to us. Uh, you are the ones providing the content for this panel, and we hope that we can give you the answers that you're looking for. So just a little bit of background. Number one, what is the Affordable Care Act? And if our panelists can take it away. Okay. Um, so the Affordable Care Act is a legislation by the federal government that says that all Americans should be able to access health insurance um, or else they might have to pay a fee if they don't have health insurance. Uh, one of the first provisions of the Affordable Care Act that is especially um, changing in the insurance market is that young people can stay <coughs> insurance health plans until age 26. It used to be sometimes 21, sometimes 18, really depending on the insurance company. And so now it is standard across all insurances that young people up to age 26 should be allowed to stay on their parents' coverage. Um, it also, the Affordable Care Act, includes financial assistance provisions for a number of people, including an expansion of the Medicaid system. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so that's just a little bit of basic information about what the law is. Um, so second question, what services are covered without a copay under the Affordable Care Act? So for uh, the women's preventative services are covered, and that includes things like birth control, annual exams, STI testing, um, even gestational diabetes um, testing, as well as things for um, breastfeeding supplies and interpersonal violence screening, which I think is really important that everyone understands there's a lot of good services that are now available without a copay. That's just some of them. Right. Um, no, those are all really important things. Thank you so much. Um, so the next question we have, do this was submitted by someone who is currently on Medicaid and wants to know, do I have to fill out any paperwork if I'm already on Medicaid? So um, if you are on Medicaid, if you already have Medicaid, then there's nothing that you have to do. Um, if you aren't already receiving services from Medicaid, you may be entitled to services from Medicaid because Medicaid is expanding. And you would just have to fill out regular paperwork for Medicaid. There's nothing additional to do for the ACA. Thank you so much, Dr. Kuznia. Um, number four is uh, one of the most important questions about this law. How do I sign up and when is the deadline? Sure, so first of all, the deadline for signing up for a insurance plan um, is March 31st currently, although it may be changing because of the problems with the health insurance exchange websites. Um, but currently, 
it was supposed to be open October 1st of this year through March 31st of next year for people to be able to sign up and not have to pay any fees or anything until they and they have all that time to sign up and pick a plan that they want. Um, how do I sign up? So you've probably heard a lot about the troubles on the health insurance websites, um, but healthcare.gov is still the place where they're fixing the websites and you should still be able to sign up if you're tech savvy. Um, there is the nationalhealthcare.gov site as well as states have their own websites. Some states have a more robust website than others, so it really depends on where you live. Um, there's also patient can assist patients in signing up. So you can do that at localhelp.healthcare.gov or you can call a phone number that is in 150 languages um, and that phone number is 1-800-318-2596. We're also going to be posting all of this information so if you touch it now we'll send it to you. Um, and you can also even sign up by mail. So if you have access to a computer, if you have access to a phone, if you have access to a healthcare provider, they might be able to help you get hooked up with a person who's a navigator, or you can also sign up by mail. And again, the period in which we're supposed to sign up is between October 1st of this year and March 31st of 2014. Uh, thank you so much, Doctor. Um, I just want to reemphasize the point that she made that the healthcare.gov website, while it has been having some troubles, is not the only way for folks to be able to enroll. The phone number that she gave actually is open 24 hours a day, and as she mentioned, is available in 150 languages. So um, if you or your family or, or friends or anyone that you know um, needs help in whatever language it could be, because it's uh, so important for folks to have this information, it's 1-800- 318-2596. And as Dr. Kuznia said, we'll provide this information um, as well. This uh, this Hangout right now will be posted afterwards as a YouTube video, and you'll be able to click right from this video um, to that. Stay tuned for that. Um, our next question came from um, one of our audience members who's concerned about, um, about their parents. So the question is, my parents currently pay too much for health insurance. How can they determine whether they're eligible for cheaper health insurance? Vanessa, can you give us a little sure. help with that one? <laughs> sure. So there's a couple of different ways. If you go to websites, there's um, cost calculators that allows you to input all of the um, household information, including your annual income, the size of your um, family. Also, for some, you may have to think about if you have, if you are a smoker. Um, your age, those types of things. Now, that's not to say um, one of the key aspects of this law is that you cannot be denied for pre-existing conditions. So keep that in mind. But under the cost calculator, um, I know Planned Parenthood on our website, we have it at PlannedParenthoodHealthInsurance.org, you can log on there and it's pretty simple to enter that information in and get an estimate of the cost. Um, the other thing is that you can also um, when you go to navigators, when you call the um, 1 800 line, you can also provide some very basic information and they can provide you additional um, guidance. I think it's important, though, to keep in mind that these are estimates and so you may not be receiving the exact cost. That's why it's important that you also know what your parameters are and how much you can afford for insurance and make sure that you're asking the questions um, to get what you really need for coverage. So there's, a, a, there's many important things that I think um, go into what this cost is going to be, but obviously um, if one of the main concerns is just you know paying that monthly bill, there are people who can help you and online as well. Thank you so much. Um, would you mind just saying that website one more time for that cost calculator? Sure. Well, for ours in particular, you can go to uh, PlannedParenthoodHealthInsuranceFacts.org for English. You can also go to um, PlannedParenthoodAsegurate.org for Spanish language. And we have the cost calculator on both websites. Great, thank you. And in addition, I know if you go when you go to healthcare.gov, uh, there's before you even start enrolling for anything, you can get estimates on there as well. So that's another resource. Um, thank you so much. Um, our next question, can individuals who qualify for deferred action or DACA get health insurance under the new regulation, regulations. Uh, Kimberly, can you help us with that one? 
Sure. So the DACA program was a really, really great opportunity for young people to gain a kind of lawful status and, and be able to stay in this country without fear of deportation. Unfortunately, one of the restrictions of DACA was that for the purposes of health care, DACA qualified folks are not considered lawfully present. So they're excluded from the health exchanges, they're excluded from Medicaid. Obviously this is a huge problem because if you're lawful for the purposes of working and going to school, you should be lawful for the purposes of getting health care. Um, so this is an unfortunate limitation of DACA. It's something a lot of us have been working to change. Um, and it also has implications for mixed status families. I think one of the important pieces to know about the Affordable Care Act is while it does a lot of good things for folks who are um, citizens and for some people who are lawfully present, um, insurance online won't be used uh, for any purpose besides health insurance. It won't be used um, for any immigration procedures or anything else. So it's um, it's something that families should know about so that they can feel safe in, in enrolling for health insurance through these websites. Um, thank you so much, Kimberly, for that. Uh, okay, our next question. Um, the time before the ACA, women paid more for health insurance across the board. It was basically gender discrimination. And so that is now over. Being a woman is no longer a pre-existing condition. So that's a huge deal. We're very excited about that. Um, the other piece that's really important is in terms of those specific kinds of preventive care that are now going to be covered without copay. So Vanessa mentioned um, intimate partner violence screening and counseling, which is so important. Um, well woman visits, so that's an annual exam. Um, screening for gestational diabetes, really important for the health of pregnant women. Um, HPV testing, counseling for STIs, for sexually transmitted diseases. Um, counseling and screening for HIV, which is really important, we know, for our Latino population where we have elevated incidence of HIV, um, as well as contraception, FDA-approved prescription contraception, breastfeeding support supplies and counseling. Um, and so as a package, what we see is, you know, whether a woman is trying to prevent pregnancy, whether a woman is trying to care for her pregnancy, or whether she's trying to care for her own sexual and reproductive health, that all of these measures help her be healthier and help her family be healthier. Perfect. Thank you so much. That's um, That was so comprehensive. Um, those are really important benefits. Um, are, and these things, uh, and maybe Dr. Kuznia can help us with that, these benefits, are these all things that we need to, when we as women go to our, our exams, that we need to be making sure that we're screened for, or are they things that are going to automatically uh, be taken into account, things like the domestic violence screening and, and those other features? Sure. So most of the or pretty much all of these recommendations we have discussed already, your provider is already aware of that and will be asking you those questions in general at a well woman exam, which is what we consider to be an, a reproductive health exam for women of childbearing age. And so all of those things should already be included. If you have specific questions, of course, that is the time to ask them. Um, and, you know, they might not ask you in person. They might also, depending on the provider, they might have a questionnaire or something that you fill out. So they are supposed to be asking you about all of these things, but they may spend a different amount of time talking with you specifically about which ones might apply to your situation most. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, our next question, just building up on the previous one, what preventive services does the ACA cover and how will the level of coverage change for women as a result of the law? Sure. So I think Kimberly already mentioned some of the preventive services, but when we talk about health care, there are aspects of care that are to keep you healthy and prevent health can prevent illness conditions, and there are things about health to treat any conditions you have. So the prevention side of things, that is what we do screenings for, for breast cancer, doing mammograms. That is cervical cancer screening in the form of pap smears. Um, that is different vaccinations. That is different other blood tests that are for women specifically as well as all persons. So for women specifically, we talk about the mammograms and the cervical cancer screenings or pap smears, and those are for breast cancer and cervical cancer. Can you tell um, a little bit more about what that is for maybe anyone listening who's never had a, a mammogram or no, doesn't know what that is and what a pap smear is? Absolutely, sure. So a mammogram is an x-ray of the breast tissue, and so it's taken from multiple angles, so a lot of women will remember it as a procedure which 
which sort of squeeze their breasts so it can be uncomfortable, but this is a x-ray taken from multiple angles to look for any changes in the breast density of a normal healthy breast tissue versus what we expect to see if there's any evidence of any tumors, abnormalities, things that might lead to cancer or might be cancer themselves. Um, a cervical cancer screening is a pap smear. So a pap smear is typically a part of a pelvic exam. So when somebody has a pelvic exam, um, it is a sample that we take from the tissues around the cervix, which is the entrance to the uterus, which is the cervix is the part that we talk about, oh, it's two centimeters, it's five centimeters, it's 10 centimeters, when a woman is about to have a baby. So normally that cervix is closed, and when you're pregnant and giving birth, that opens. But when it's closed, we take a little sample from the cells there to check for HPV or cervical cancer. Wow. And and just a quick comment on the um, on the pap smears. This is really important for Latinas because we have the highest incidence of cervical cancer of any population. And so it's really important that we're getting that care um, because while on the one hand a lot of Latinas are getting are getting sick and they're struggling with cervical cancer, this is a disease that is treatable and preventable. Okay. Thank you so much um, for that, and thank you, Dr. Kuznia, for being so thorough about that. Um, it's it's something really important and for anyone who's watching um, if you are a woman or if you're not a woman know uh, someone in your family that you care about um, pass this information on it's it could save people's lives um, our next question um, so we mentioned a little bit about um, uh, screenings for cervical cancer the next question is does the ACA cover the HPV vaccine Vanessa <laughs> Sorry, I see a bunch of smiles. It's great. Um, so, yes, the ACA does cover the HPV vaccine. Um, it's, again, part of the preventive care, right? So if you can get the HPV vaccine, then you can be vaccinated um, against certain strains that may cause cervical cancer. I mean, there's, and the doctor can speak more to this, but there's numerous, numerous, numerous strains of HPV and some of those um may lead to cervical cancer and some may not, which is, to Kimberly's point, really important that women really go in and get screened, especially now under ACA, that pap smears and other blood tests are without charge. Um, and I should have probably said this before, I'm sorry, but HPV stands for human papillomavirus, which as Vanessa mentioned, uh, there can be numerous strains and that's uh, the virus that can cause cervical cancer. So. Um, this is one of the services that's included under the Affordable Care Act. It's important to, to, to know that we can take advantage of these things. Um, our next question actually comes from, um, from a young man who, who asks, I am a young man, why does my health plan cost the same as the health plan of a woman my age who uses services that I'll never need? It's a, it's a very important question to, to address. Is Dr. Ramos on? She isn't, actually. Okay, um, so I can jump in here. So the first thing I would say to our young men is um, sexual and reproductive health is also an issue that you face, and many of these um, preventive measures will also help young men. Um, so, you know, we talk about things like STI screenings, HIV screenings, those are just as important for young men as for young women. Um, I'm glad that Vanessa mentioned the HPV vaccine because actually young men should and can also get the HPV vaccine, um, not because they'll get cervical cancer, but because it will prevent HPV, which is good for them, and it will prevent them from passing HPV to their partners, which is really good for those women that they're having sex with. So everybody wins. Um, and looking at the issue a little bit more broadly, I think one thing the ACA does that's so important is it recognizes we all have different health care needs, right? I mean, I don't have a prostate, um, but I, far be it for me to deny a man prostate health, right? So it's just important that we're all able to get the health care we need based on whatever our bodies um, are and, and whatever they need. Thanks so much, Kimberly. Um, Dr. Ramos, I see that you're on with us. Welcome. Okay, maybe she can't hear us just yet, um, but we appreciate her being on with us anyway. Um, our next question, um, Dr. Kuzni, if you can help us with this one, um, is more of a medical question. At what age should a young woman start seeing an OB gyne, an obstetrician gynecologist, and what should she expect on her first visit? Sure. Um, so 
we're talking about women having women specific health exams so that can be I just want to clarify it can be from an obstetrician gynecologist it can be from a family medicine physician it can be from an internal medicine medicine physician or it can be from a number of other providers PAs nurse practitioners or physician assistants who can all provide primary care for women so primary care for women um, includes typically a pelvic exam we think annually is a good general idea of how often the typical woman should have a, a health screening um, but certain women may need it more often or less often depending on their age other health factors and sort of what's going on in their lives um, so when should a woman start seeing one of these primary health care providers um, typically we would like to see a woman uh, once she reaches reproductive age so once she starts having periods when she starts um, thinking about contraception, becoming sexually active, or even if she's not sexually active, just so that she's talking to a doctor, knows um, whether how her body is functioning is normal or abnormal, and can get advice on those types of things. Um, then the other question is, what should a woman expect at that first visit? Um, so like I said, typically you will have, you might have it split into two visits, but there will be a period of sort of history taking and us getting to know you and your health history and your family's health history and all that sort of information and that might be one whole visit or they might do both parts combined where they call the history taking and then they also the provider will do a pelvic exam and at that time they may or may not take samples for a pap smear um, or sexually transmitted infection testing um, they might do blood samples and they might also do a clinician breast exam with their hands and then at that point they might decide if you should have an ultrasound or a mammogram depending on your age, your circumstances, your history, your family history, and your overall health. Wow, that's quite a lot. <laughs> I can see why they would maybe space it into two visits. Um, thank you so much for that explanation. Um, so moving to our next question, uh, how does the Affordable Care Act affect birth control? So I'll, I'll take this one. <laughs> so one of the great things is that um, in the insurance plans, all insurance plans have to cover birth control. Now the key point there though is they don't necessarily have to cover every type. So that's why it's important that if you have a specific type of birth control that you enjoy, whatever the brand may, name may be, you need to have a conversation with your doctor as well as with the insurance company as to whether or not they will cover that specific brand. And the other thing is also um, IUDs as a more long-term form of birth control as well. That's another conversation to have with your insurance. But the no copay birth control is a huge thing, um, particularly for Latinas. Latinos tend to be um, one of the groups of folks and we do not take our birth control consistently um, and one of the main barriers to that is cost and accessibility. So I know we've had various conversations with women around Planned Parenthood health centers who are concerned because they only may have a pill pack for one month and that's what they can afford so what does that mean? So it's great that the ACA now takes some of that concern in terms of the financial costs off um, Obviously, we still have some issues regarding accessibility, but again, that's an important conversation to have with your insurance company as well as your doctor if there is a particular brand that you really enjoy having. Um, Vanessa, you mentioned an acronym, IUD. Can you explain what that is for anyone who might not be familiar with that? <laughs> sure. Um, it's an interuterine device, and what it is, you may see this, and folks should, you know, again, talk to their physician about it, but it's a little bit of a T type um, device that goes into the uterus and please doctors correct me if I am incorrect in describing this <laughs> but it goes into the uterus and it acts as more of a long-term form of birth control and there are two types there's some that um, release med medicine essentially medicated prescription and there's others that are copper IUDs and those are inserted um, by a physician um, you know again it's an important conversation to have and they can also be removed but it's a longer form of long-term family planning. And just to expand a little bit about some of the birth control options, 
Um, so Vanessa mentioned the IUD. Um, some of the other birth control options that are generally that are available without copay, though you might have to, you know, you might not be your exact brand. So we're talking about birth control pills, the pills you take every day, the birth control patch, the patch that you actually put on your skin, and it releases birth control uh, medication that way, as well as the vaginal ring. So the newer ring you probably heard, and it's like a circular ring that fits inside the vagina and also releases birth control medication. So generally speaking, those are the kinds of birth control that are available without copay. Um, other kinds of birth control that are really important tools in our toolbox but aren't covered are things like condoms and emergency contraception, right? things that we would call like over-the-counter birth control. So you can go to, you know, like your CVS or your 7-Eleven and get a box of condoms. That's a really good birth control method. It prevents pregnancy and protects against HIV and STIs. Um, but that's not going to be covered without copay. And then the other piece is EC or emergency contraception. You might have heard it referred to as the morning after pill, although it actually works for three days, um, not just one, um, up to three days after unprotected sex. So if a condom breaks um, or if you don't use a condom or you don't use birth control, you can go and get something called Plan B, um, and it's over the counter. You don't need a prescription. Um, or you just can go to the, the you know, maybe the supermarket or the, the, um, the pharmacy and ask for Plan B. So really good methods, but you will have to pay out of pocket. Thank you for, for adding that, Kimberly. That was actually our next question. Our question was, what contraception options are not covered by the Affordable Care Act? Um, are there any others that you know about that haven't been mentioned already from, to any of our panelists? I mean, I think for us, um, you know, part of the big conversation has been the EC. Um, though, you know, again, like Kimberly said, it's over the counter, but you will have to pay for it. And so that also gets to some of the questions about accessibility and who can afford um, the cost for the EC. Great. Thank you. Um, our next question is also, surprise, about contraception. Um, one of our viewers wanted to know, is contraception available for minors under the Affordable Care Act? And if so, what are, what are the stipulations surrounding that? So, for um, teens and adolescents, one of the big issues on this is going to be confidentiality. So yes, that they are able to receive um, birth control via a physician, right? And so it's at no copay. But what the insurance companies may do is, and I'm sure many of you have seen this, is sometimes you will get a notice for the insurance company about um, the coverage that they just provided. So it typically has like a little line at the top that says this is not a bill that it'll tell what they covered and what the cost was that they covered. And so that is still an option that may happen. So for us, again, the big thing is making sure that everyone is aware about the confidentiality there and having that conversation with the physician if an adolescent does, uh, a teen or adolescent wants access to birth control. Thank you for that, Vanessa. Um, that's, that's important to know. The next question, we're moving on a little bit to a different aspect of women's health. Um, does the Affordable Care Act include coverage for pregnancy and prenatal care? What exactly will it include? And what about postnatal care? If our doctors could help us out with that one. Sure. Um, so the Affordable Care Act should ensure coverage for pregnancy, including prenatal care and postnatal care for all women. Um, what exactly will it include? So there are um, statements by the United States Preventive Services Task Force of what are standard screenings such as the gestational diabetes screening, sexually transmitted infections, screenings for anemia. So all of these things that help keep pregnant women and the fetus is healthy, those are included in a standard of care that physicians as a whole around the United States believe these are the safe things we should do for women and all of those things should be included in all prenatal care and in prenatal care that is covered by the Affordable Care Act. In terms of postnatal care, that typically includes at least one visit depending on if a woman has had a cesarean section or a vaginal birth, um, it depends on the timing, but at least one visit after the pregnancy should be covered. Great, thank you for that. Um, 
going along with uh, the topic of pregnancy, one of our user, our audience members wants to know, will maternity co-pays be covered under the Affordable Care Act? So um, I think Dr. Ramos had a better answer for this one, but she's not able to. Hi, this is Dr. Ramos. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, welcome, Dr. Ah, Ramos. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Ramos, um, this question was actually uh, addressed to you, and the question is, will maternity co-pays be covered under the Affordable Care Act? Oh, I think we might have some technical glitches. Dr. Kuznia, would you mind just filling in for this? So it's really going to be please. dependent upon Thank the you. type of health insurance that you have. It will... Be, uh, the copay may or may not be covered, so that really depends upon the deductible under the health plan that's selected under the health exchanges. So whether it's a, a bronze, a, a silver, or a platinum through the exchanges, hmm. okay, we're having a little technical difficulty. So like Dr. Robert, it really depends on health insurance. Yeah, can you hear me? Dr. Ramos, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Ramos. Yeah, so it really depends upon the, the health plan through the exchanges that was selected um, and, also, and also through um, their private insurance as to what they cover. Okay. okay. Thank you so much for that. Um, okay, we've covered a little bit about mammograms already, but one of our audience members wants to know, at what age should a woman start getting mammograms? Sure, so I can take So all health insurance ACA will definitely for that age 50 can get gram in their insurance at no cost at least two years starting at age 50. Some plans, and for some women, it may be more often, and it may be at a younger age. Okay. Sorry, I think I'm having a little delay on my end. Um, thank you, Dr. Kuznia. Um, the follow-up question ties into that, actually. So you mentioned the, you know, the age at which it's recommended to get a mammogram. Um, but one of our uh, our female audience members asked, will all plans include breast exams and mammograms? And if so, starting at what age, which you've already covered. Um, but she wants to know as well, will women under 30 be allowed to have mammograms at no additional cost? I know that I've heard at least that there are a few stipulations surrounding that. If you could tell us a little bit more about that. Um, and then the difference between it, a breast exam and, and a mammogram um, as far as age, uh, that would be great. Thanks. Sure. Um, so the question specifically about getting a mammogram at a younger age, so I mentioned yes. starting at age 50, it's always covered. And prior to that, may be covered depending on the woman's own health history and if she's had breast cancer or they've found abnormalities on like ultrasounds before. And of course, if she has a family history of breast cancer, she may need to start getting mammograms sooner. So it's very dependent on that, that person's exact circumstances. In general, no, not all 30-year-old women are going to have to have mammograms because we just know that it will be a waste of their time and we'll actually do more harm than good because we'll investigate things that aren't cancer. But for certain women, they will be entitled to get mammograms included in their insurance. And that actually shouldn't change because of the ACA. That's something that should have already been happening. Okay, and then 
Um, the difference between a clinical breast exam and a mammogram, so I already explained a mammogram is this multi-directional x-ray of the breast tissue, and a mm -hmm. clinical breast exam is a exam using the hands uh, where a physician or a provider is feeling for any abnormal lumps or bumps in the breast tissue because, as we all know, some lumps and bumps are very normal, and we as lay people might not know what is normal or not. Mm -hmm. Great. So I know we've talked a lot about different kinds of pregnancy-related care, like prenatal care and postnatal care. And another kind of pregnancy-related care um, that we want to talk about is also abortion services. So we know that, that particularly in the, in the Latina community, um, but generally for all women, one in three women will need an abortion in her lifetime. Um, and the ACA, there's good news, good news and bad news in terms of access to abortion. Um, so unfortunately, the ACA leaves in place the Hyde Amendment, which means that women who are on Medicaid, um, generally speaking, will not have a coverage for abortion services unless they live in a state that is making sure that that coverage is available using state funds. So you have to, basically, you're one of the 15 states that provide that. Um, nationally, unfortunately, that coverage is withheld. Um, it's all similarly true with the exchanges. So the healthcare exchanges, which are the private markets where people can buy insurance for themselves. Um, in many of the exchanges, there are plans available that provide coverage for abortion. Um, unfortunately, in some states, there have actually been laws that ban coverage for abortion in the exchanges. And this is going to make it really hard for those women to get the coverage that they need. Yeah, no, definitely just to echo Kimberly's um, comments, we know that, you know, again, we've talked about some things that are, are included, but abortion services are not necessarily included. Plans do not have to include them. Um, and so I keep wanting to go back to this idea about what women really need to ask. And sometimes abortion is not something that you think um, you need to ask about, but it's always good to empower yourself. You don't know what may happen down the road. So as you're asking questions about birth control, about um, specific screenings, about testing, we would really recommend that you also ask if a specific plan covers, covers abortion, and if so, how would they cover that? So Kimberly said some states outright outlaw that, um, and some do not. So just make sure that you're empowered and that you have that knowledge going forward before you sign up for a plan. Thank you so much, ladies, for those answers. Um, our next question um, is dealing with the topic that's a little bit more sensitive. We mentioned in the previous question some of the new features of the Affordable Care Act and among them is domestic violence screenings. Um, and so our question is, how will the Affordable Care Act impact victims of domestic violence? Um, yeah, I think that what's important here is, I think, I'm not sure, I'm sorry, I'm part of it, we had technical difficulties here with the internet. Um, one of the things that is important to notice here is that Domestic violence will no longer be considered a pre-existing condition for um, a woman when considering uh, when applying for coverage with insurance or one of the exchanges. Um, and there will also be domestic violence screenings that will become part of uh, regular health preventative health care. Um, just to build on that, one other way that um, survivors of, of violence also benefit from the ACA is we just know, generally speaking, that when women are experiencing violence, when they're in an abusive relationship, um, contact with a healthcare provider of any kind can be really transformative. So for a woman who may be isolated, who may be experiencing abuse, um, just the simple act of seeing a doctor allows for a conversation about her well-being that she may not be able to have otherwise. So. There is an overall benefit to all to all survivors of violence just by virtue of seeing a provider who's going to sit down and ask them, you know, how are you doing? What's going on in your life? Um, Dr. Kuzia, I, I know this wasn't um, one of your original questions, but as a as a medical practitioner, um, what what would you say to someone who who might be in a situation like that um, about being open with their their healthcare professional and just putting them at ease. Sure. Um, well, we've heard everything all before. Whatever's happening to you, we want to help you with and we want to know about. I mean, I make it a point to outright ask these things that might be uncomfortable questions. Some providers might 
not ask them currently, but I think with the ACA, they should be asking these questions. Sometimes we might ask you to fill out a survey and answer questions like this so that you don't have to say it out loud if it's something that you have trouble saying out loud, and then we might ask you about it. Um, but I do feel that it's a very important aspect of changes with the Affordable Care Act and inventive health in, in general. And depending on the situation, I would provide a patient with resources, either written or a phone number or a place to go, uh, depending on how urgent the situation is and what he or she thinks that they would like to and are able to do about it. Um, great, thank you. Um, so we have our next question. Um, is also a very interesting one. This person says, I work for an organization that frowns on the use of contraception. Will my employer-based health insurance plan be required to cover birth control under the Affordable Care Act? I know this one's been a little bit hazy and it's been a lot in the news lately, but if, um, if we can have a little insight, that'd be great. So there was a meeting last week, I believe, on this. Um, and while originally, um, and I, I'm, some of you folks can help me out with this one if I get it correct. Um, originally, the religious-based employers were not going to be exempted from the birth control mandate to cover birth control and the insurance, in, insurance um, coverage. Um, but what I understand is that they are, there is now a new exemption for organizations that are owned by like a few individuals and it might violate their, uh, their beliefs. So, uh, so there is a, a minor exemption, I think. And I, I think I will leave fleshing that out a little bit. Okay. Uh, I just want to piggyback on that. As a part of the Care Act, the goal is to make more insurance options available to all persons. So if somebody is in a situation like that where their based insurance does not cover something they feel they need, then exactly the type of person who can go on the insurance exchanges and get different price plan and be able to talk with their employer to work that out so that the money their employer was paying for their health insurance might be reimbursed in a different way so that they can get a different health insurance plan. Okay, um, that I think cut out a little bit, so I'll, for anyone who may not have heard, I'll just repeat what Dr. Pizzi was saying. She mentioned that um, if anyone finds him or herself in a situation where their employer doesn't cover some of these services, there may be an option on the online exchanges um, to find the coverage that you're lacking and possibly even to find a way to be reimbursed for the coverage that your current health plan doesn't provide. So thank you so much. Just to add to that, as you're going through the process, uh, particularly on um, healthcare.gov, that's one of the questions that you're asked as to whether or not you qualify for coverage through your insurer. So if you do, then you can say yes. That doesn't mean that you're going to be stopped, that you don't get to go any further in looking at different plans. So I just want to note that if you are um, working in a religious institution or another institution that has stated their intention that they prefer not to provide or as a religious institution that they will not be providing um, and you decide to go ahead and shop on the marketplace, don't be alarmed that that's one of the questions. It doesn't mean that you're excluded, but it does mean that you may have some extra steps to go through. Great. Thank you so much for making that clarification. Um, so we've come now to our, our last question, and I'll leave it open to each one of our panelists to make closing comments. What would be the most important takeaway that you would tell our audience from this hangout with regard to, to their health, um, women's health, the Affordable Care Act? Um, I'll go first. That's a that's a big question. There's so many things. Um, I think overall, it's really important that women feel empowered to make decisions for their own health care. Oftentimes, as Latinas, we take care of the rest of the family before we will take care of ourselves, and we will send everyone else to the doctor before we will go. And so, the Affordable Care Act is really an opportunity to take care of yourself um, through the websites. Which again, it's it's a website. It's not the law itself. So right now with all the glitches um, in English and Spanish, there's still other options as were mentioned. So make sure that um, you find that avenue that works best for you to get the information and make sure that you ask your insurer 
what they do cover because you do have rights under this law that you need to feel comfortable asking and feel empowered to ask to make sure that you're getting the best care possible for yourself as well as your family. The other key point, sorry, the other one point that I want to make, if you are in a mixed status family, it's really important um, to fight back against some of those um, that misinformation that is out there. The information will not be used um, for ICE. There is no immigration status that will change because of information that you provided. Um, through to get health care, you should still look to sign up other members of your families that do qualify, your children, your grandchildren. Um, this is really important, so we're really pushing that people do that. And if you have any questions, please feel free to visit Planned Parenthood Health Insurance Facts.org in English or Planned Parenthood Asegurate.org in Spanish. Thanks, Vanessa. Sure. So we'll go down the line. Laura, closing comments? Sorry that I got it. Um, I think what's important for me as as a woman, as a mother, and someone who's um, taking care of the, the health care decisions for my own family is to just have all of the, the accurate information. And I think there, you know, there are a number of organizations that are represented on the call. We're all um, capable of giving good information, um, especially um, we, we do work in different states, and so we can provide information based on state. Um, I think that as well what's important for folks to know is even though that the healthcare.gov um, site is not working, for example here in California you can um, get on the California State Exchange uh, website and get information there. Uh, and that's, uh, so CLRJ, California Latinas for Reproductive Justice, will also be doing um, ACA community forums throughout California. We, we started those earlier this year and we'll be looking to continue them so you can visit our website to find out if there's more, uh, if there's one coming near you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate having having your expertise on us, in spite of the technical difficulties. Um, Kimberly, if you'll if you'll give your closing comments. Sure. Um, so I think the biggest message that I would leave people with is that this law, um, you know, for for those of you who are, are eligible for the benefits, this law is a real opportunity to take control of your sexual and reproductive health. So, you know, looking at whether you want to prevent and plan pregnancy with the use of contraception, whether you want to protect yourself and your partner by getting screened for HIV, for STIs, um, secure your long-term health by getting cancer screenings, this is an opportunity to, for you to put your health in your own hands and to do so without being um, without being restricted because you can't afford it. Um, because that's what this is really about, right? The, the, the amount of money in your pocket shouldn't determine what kind of health care you get. Thank you. Very eloquently said. Uh, Dr. Kuznia? Sure. Um, so as a health care provider, I feel like the Affordable Care Act changes really put an emphasis on the preventive services that we can provide. So I don't, I don't want to just see people when they're sick. I want to keep them well. And so to keep people well, I need you to come and see me when you are feeling fine and great and healthy. And that's when we'll do those well woman exams. We'll do the screenings. When you come in and you're sick, I can't do all the well stuff as well as the sick stuff. So the Affordable Care Act should provide you with um, the decreased co-pays, more coverage so that you can feel comfortable getting all of these services and not have to worry about the cost. Exactly. Um, amen to all of that. Um, for the Latino community, I know um, currently we, as has been mentioned already, we are the most underserved and uninsured population in the United States. and the cost is a, is a very big factor and I just want to echo what, what everyone has said about making sure that we educate ourselves and that we take advantage of the opportunities uh, to become insured through the Affordable Care Act um, so that we don't have to um, be waiting until the last minute and have to go to the emergency rooms um, when, when something happens to us. Um, as Dr. Cusino was saying, we can have the opportunity to, to maintain our health and, and prevent these problems before they, before they arise. Um, I want to again just to, th to thank everyone who submitted questions and to thank each of our panelists for, for their time and for their insights and their expertise. I know I've definitely learned a lot and I hope that each one of you watching has learned a lot as well. Uh, for anyone who, 
who wanted to, you know, if you're sitting there thinking, man, I wish my, my mom or my sister or my friend were watching this with me, uh, the good news is that this video will be available on YouTube shortly, and so after the hand is over, you can still forward that link, and anyone who didn't get the chance to watch live will still be able to participate in that way. Um, we also have, um, as Voto Latino, with our, with our partners, um, we have a healthcare website that has a lot of information um, specifically for Latinos. That website is, uh, it's shown on the slide right now, and you'll see that website is latinosforhealthcare.com. If you want to stay up to date about, about the Affordable Care Act or even uh, to receive notifications for our next Google Hangout, um, make sure that you visit that website and, and provide your information so we can keep in touch. Thank you so much, everybody, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.